Good afternoon, and welcome to the Power of Arts and Sciences Week. We started this series last year to highlight the impact of arts and sciences on the lives of our students and alumni and on the world. I am delighted that so many of you have joined us today for the kickoff event. This year, the series holds special meaning and the video you just saw captures the excitement we are feeding. Today marks the public launch of our strategic plan, our vision for the next decade of arts and sciences. We've been working on this for nine months now, and just this morning, we released our plans, a plan to the world. A link is in the chat, and I hope you will take time to look through it. Our plan is a roadmap designed to move us forward, bolstering the education we offer, advancing the scholarship we produce, and strengthening the wonderful community that we are all a part of. To help us mark the launch of the strategic plan, we have two special guests joining us today. Dr. Beverly Wenland is Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at WashU. She sets the academic strategy for the university in close collaboration with the chancellor, deans, faculty, and others across campus. Please join me in welcoming Provost Wenland. Okay. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here with all of you to celebrate the power of arts and sciences. As a former dean of an arts and sciences college, I know just how central arts and sciences is to all that a university aspires to be. As I look at this week's programming, I am excited to see so many parts of arts and sciences brought to life, and I look forward to all of these events. I want to congratulate the arts and sciences community on the launch of the strategic plan today. Dean Hu has spoken of this community's work in developing the plan, and it is so inspiring to see the shared effort that has gone into this process. It's a plan that the school should be proud of, one that is filled with bold, innovative ideas for driving convergence, creativity, and community. As you know, the university is itself in the midst of a strategic planning process. From the launch of our university-wide planning, I've operated with one simple conviction. Our university-wide plan should be stronger because of the school-level plans, and the school-level strategic plans will be stronger because of the university-wide plan. Now, given the timeline of the arts and sciences planning process, this effort has required sustained attention. I've been working closely with Dean Hu to ensure that we've stayed in alignment, and he's met directly with all of our working group co-chairs and our entire steering committee to ensure that we'd capture the direction of arts and sciences plan. At the same time too, our university-wide process has benefited from so many representatives from all parts of arts and sciences. The arts and sciences community is represented on every single one of our committees. In total, we have about 60 members of arts and sciences embedded in our process, including several of the arts and sciences steering committee members. It really has been such a joy to work directly with so many of our colleagues in arts and sciences. A strategic plan is only as strong as the people who build it. It's ultimately the people who will bring arts and sciences plan to life. And I can tell you, I have seen the amazing talent and all of the thoughtful people who are part of arts and sciences. And it's so exciting to know how fully invested you are in the work that we are doing here at WashU. So I want to take this moment to congratulate all of you on coming up with this amazing plan. And I cannot wait to see all that you will accomplish. Thank you so much, Beverly. I look forward to continuing our work together to elevate arts and sciences and the entire university. And now I have the privilege to introduce Chancellor Andrew Martin, who has been leading Washington University since 2019. Chancellor Martin is a stalwart supporter of arts and sciences 
and he has had close ties with our school for decades. Chancellor Martin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Hu, and thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, as an alumnus of the School of Arts and Sciences and a believer in the crucial role of the humanities in our rapidly changing world, it is with such great excitement uh, that I bring you news that I will, I believe, transform the study of arts and sciences at Washington University. Uh, recently, our Board of Trustees approved a proposal to create a state-of-the-art new building for arts and sciences located to the west of Olin Library and north of Graham Chapel, a beautiful and highly distinctive central campus site. I should note that the university will be making the financial investment in this facility. The new building presents an extraordinary opportunity for arts and sciences to enhance its academic distinction by housing premier departments and programs, support its commitment to diversity and inclusion, strengthen student-facing academic services and resources, and showcase its vibrant intellectual community through signature events and gathering spaces. The new building will enable key components of the arts and sciences and university strategic plans, a targeted investment in key departments and units that support the goal of scholarly and educational distinction. As we launch the arts and sciences strategic plan, this project underscores the scope and ambition developed. This is a time for arts and sciences at WashU to rise in prominence and visibility for the benefit of the entire university. The central location conveys the role of arts and sciences as an essential driver of the university's academic mission and its responsibility to serve as a campus connector for scholarly and educational connections with other schools and units across campus. The central historic location of the new building, the emphasis on student-centric programming, and the creation of signature event and meeting spaces will enhance the dynamic feeling of the central part of the campus and the building will serve as the visual bookend to Siegel Hall and help facilitate a planned enhancement to Mud Field. We look forward to sharing more as the project is implemented and we will certainly be reaching out periodically for input as we fine tune our plans for how the space will be utilized. But I hope you view this news as an investment, not just in the school or the campus, but in the students and faculty that comprise it. Arts and Sciences, being our largest school on the Danforth campus, is at the heart of our mission of improving lives in service of the greater good, and we are overjoyed to be able to invest so significantly in its future. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Martin, for sharing this fantastic news. We are incredibly excited for the many ways this new space will enhance our work and support our goals. With new resources, a vibrant community, and a strong vision, I truly believe the 2020s will be a transformative decade for arts and sciences at WashU. And in fact, the transformation has already begun. One exciting development within the, this remarkable year has been the arrival of a large cohort of world-class scholars joining the arts and sciences faculty through our digital transformation hiring initiative. We are particularly excited to have successfully recruited Dr. Ian Bogost from Georgia Tech. Ian is both a game designer and a theorist of digital culture. I've had the pleasure of getting to know him over the past year. And I'm constantly impressed by his range and enthusiasm. Yang's interests and energies often manifest as books aimed at general audiences. I'll share a few of his popular titles. Alien Phenomenology, or What It's Like to Be a Thing, published in 2012. The Geek's Chihuahua, a book about Apple, published in 2015. How to Talk About Video Games, also published in 2015 and Play Anything, published in 2016. Since joining WashU in July, Ian has hit the ground running. He has been a source of inspiring ideas and solid advice throughout a strategic planning process. And he's been key to integrating all the new colleagues we are bringing in as part of our digital transformation initiative. 
And beyond our school, Yang is playing a pivotal role in building new bridges between arts and sciences and the McKelvey School of Engineering. We are exceedingly lucky to have Yang as a member of our faculty and to have him present today's talk, which is titled, Think Inside the Box. I will now hand things over to my wonderful colleague, Dr. Ian Borgost, Director and Professor of Film and Media Studies. Ian. Thank you very much, Dean Hu. It's a delight uh, to address you all uh, this afternoon. So I'm a game designer and a philosopher of play. So let's start by playing a little game, shall we? I want you to consider an arrangement of nine dots in a three by three grid. Uh, the challenge, the game, is to connect all the dots with uh, a pencil or pen or with your finger on the screen, if you'd like. For example, you might do it like this, and I'm sure you could come up with other possible solutions. Uh, here are some. Now, that uh, may not strike you as terribly exciting, and you may wonder, well, gosh, who would want to play this game in the first place, which is a fair point. So let's back up and lay some groundwork. Now, people normally think of play as an activity that other people perform. But I want to invite you today to see it as a condition of things, as a state of the world waiting for you to activate it. And that state of the world invites a process of deliberately operating things within the constraints that they impose. Play isn't the opposite of work, as our natural inclination might be to conclude, but rather it is work. It's just not work as in a job. It's work like working something, like a woodworker works wood or like a dancer works the floor. And if you start to see things this way, then anything can be used playfully. And that's a liberating idea for everything that you might consider everything in your life there is likely something more to it, something you haven't seen before or which you've overlooked. Now, if that feels like a paradox, that's no accident either. And play itself is paradoxical. It produces a feeling of freedom, but it does so by reducing rather than expanding possibilities, by inviting you to play with limitation. For example, take a guitar. A guitar doesn't produce music when you do whatever you want with it, but when you do something very particular, when you hold its fretboard and strum on its strings. So with those ideas in mind, let's return to the nine dots and the same rules, connect the dots, but this time let's add another constraint. Do it without lifting your pencil from the paper. And that invalidates some of our previous solutions, but no problem. There are plenty of new alternatives uh, such as this one. And this is what I mean by this paradox. By reducing the options, the game actually became more rather than less interesting. The additional constraints um, further amplified that feeling. Now we could continue that process. Perhaps you can't cross a previous stroke to complete the puzzle, for example, and that would make working the game both harder and perhaps even more interesting. So let's start over, same deal, uh, connect the dots, uh, don't remove your pen from the paper, but this time don't worry about crossing the strokes, just do it in the fewest number of straight lines possible. So here's one answer, that's five lines, and here's another, that's, um, that's still five lines. Uh, let's see, maybe if we cross the strokes, well, that's still five lines. I wonder, can't we do it in fewer? Now, this puzzle has been around for a long time, actually. One version of it appeared as early as 1914 in Sam Lloyd's Cyclopedia of 5,000 Puzzles, Tricks, and Conundrums, a title that is maybe more likely to name a gastropub these days than a, a book of perplexers. And there's evidence that it was uh, uh, found in antiquity, just like word squares uh, appeared in the ruins of Pompeii before they became uh, word cross puzzles uh, in the modern era. But the dot puzzle I showed you remained relatively esoteric until the 1970s, after the psychologist J.P. Guilford used it in a psychometric study of human intelligence and creativity. In the two decades preceding this, uh, which is the time when the behavioral sciences and psychology in particular were very much on the rise, uh, Guilford had developed a theory 
which he dubbed structure of, in of intellect or SI for short. And SI articulated a three-dimensional model of human intelligence with three basic categories of underlying mental abilities, which Guilford called operations, things like comprehension and recall, contents, the areas uh, that you actually do work in, and products, which is this sort of algebraic process of applying a specific operation in a particular context. You don't need to worry about that too much, but you do need to know that Guilford was particularly interested in one of these, something called divergent production in his model. And that was a type of response to problem solving that he saw as key to creative thinking. And according to Guilford, Convergent production, the opposite, this is good for arriving at singular answers. A singular answer is something like, how many dots are on the screen? There's a singular answer. Divergent production, by contrast, is good for generating multiple answers, such as what are all the possible uses for a brick, which is an example that Guilford once took up in a study. Or for that matter, how one might connect the dots in this grid with four lines or fewer, another experiment to assess a divergent production. Now, you might know the answer to this puzzle yourself because, thanks to Guilford and others who performed similar studies, it's become extremely famous. There's the answer. And once you see it, the solution is obvious, but few of the subjects of the early studies, or even the later ones for that matter, managed to find it. But the idea that one might draw lines outside the boundary created by the grid of dots, that just doesn't occur to many people. They just can't think outside the box, as the saying goes. Now, nobody really knows where that phrase comes from, think outside the box, but it became an instant hit. And not necessarily among behavioral scientists who almost always refer to this test as the nine dot problem, now, it was largely the business world that became obsessed with thinking outside the box from marketers and management cult consultants uh, to executive coaches. It, it, it spread and then it spread back to engineering and art and even to psychology again. And I think you can understand why it was so seductive. Guilford and others turned the kind of murky abstraction of creativity into a mental capacity that might be measurable and testable by a simple measure such as the nine dot problem. And in turn, thinking outside the box uh, became a way to give shape to an otherwise elusive idea, the idea of human creativity. And soon enough, everyone wanted everyone else to be thinking outside the box, uh, even children. It didn't hurt that the test itself would become a kind of object lesson for its own success. Like what better way to prove your creative mettle than to play a trump card on the nine dot puzzle itself. So. How about that? There is a solution in only three lines. And by barely touching the edge of the dot, sort of like a, a, a tennis ball grazing the baseline, the dot connector seems like an even more creative renegade uh, virtuoso. I wonder if we could do better though. Do you think you could do it in one line alone? That would certainly be better than three. Well, fine, okay, put the dots on a sphere and you can draw one single line uh, connecting them or even better make the sphere, the earth itself, and you can figuratively conquer it with your literal creativity. The more outside the box you could get, the more creativity you supposedly exhibited, or so went the thinking about thinking outside boxes. More recently, outside the boxitude has become a, a rationale for measuring creative promise uh, in job interviews, for example, especially at big technology firms. So asking prospective employees, how many golf balls could fit in a 747, which is an actual question that Google used to ask some prospective employees. This is supposed to measure your capacity to think your way out of a bind, or at least to give the interviewer a sense of how you might do so. And in that way, thinking outside the box became a part of the cultural fabric, a kind of lifestyle. As one executive coaching book put it, what is the purpose of thinking outside the box if you lack the courage to live outside the box? Big words. The problem is thinking outside the box turns out to be a pretty terrible way of accounting for creativity. And in fact, in subsequent psychological studies that use this nine dot problem, participants couldn't solve the puzzle until researchers basically told them the answer. For example, by providing two guide dots outside the box and then a dot from which to begin. And if you think about it, this uh, sort of neuters the supposed purpose of the test. The problem with the dot problem 
is that it is entirely divorced from context. But rather than lamenting that con condition, the evaluator judges your performance based on whether you were able to guess a matching context. And in fairness to Guilford, this isn't what he had in mind at all, nor his followers. Divergent intelligence wasn't supposed to mean living amid a universe of trick questions. It was supposed to mean how well you could find viable approaches to new problems. And in fact, as he wrote back in 1957, actually, we can hardly say there is a problem unless the situation presents the necessity for new production of some kind. It wasn't meant to be artificial, in other words. Guilford's brick from the experiment inviting alternative purposes for it, this offers a useful counterpoint. You know what a brick is, you know, it's a building material. And if, if I asked you to elaborate new uses of the brick, that would be reasonable to do because I know that you know something about a brick, you know what it does, you know that it's heavy, you know that it's rectangular and hard and earthen, you know that it could become a doorstop or a domino or a deadly weapon, or even a luxury good bought and traded for its very uselessness. So let's return to the interpretation of the dot game when I started. And I had you imagine just drawing lines between the dots until every dot had a line. Now that felt boring when we first brought it up, but it was also a totally artificial situation. I presented the game to you absent any further context. Imagine instead that you're on a work conference call or perhaps that your least interesting extended relative has phoned you up. Now, as you participate, as it were, in this conversation, you find yourself doodling on paper, drawing sets of nine dots in a three by three grid, and then connecting them, each one in a new or slightly different way. In this case, the rationale for your activity isn't to solve a problem or even to propose clever alternatives, but it's just to fill the empty time with a mildly interesting diversion. And exploring that overall solution space becomes the aim rather than finding one clever answer. Now, when I talk about play with people like all of you, I often tell a story about a game my young daughter once invented. When she was four years old or so at a, at a time of year, just like this, I dragged her to a crowded mall during the, the holiday rush. And I, I don't remember what I was doing, but I just wanted to get it done and leave. And I was impatient with her as I was kind of riddled with the angst of adult life. But she made the best of it. I, I, as I tugged her by the hand through the throngs, she, she stared down at her shoes, making sure her feet fell between the grout lines of the square ceramic floor tiles. And this was kind of like a, a vertiginous carnival ride-like interpretation of the old Victorian step on a crack superstition with me acting as an engine of sorts for her game as I pulled her along so she could look down and not worry about where she was going. But my daughter didn't know about step on a crack at this point in her life. She kind of rediscovered it on her own, unprompted almost, just by responding to the world that she found before her. Now, it might be tempting to interpret that act as a thinking outside the box moment. Isn't this what Guilford means by divergent production? You know, some kind of early sign of her budding creative intelligence, sure to fill the sales of her future enterprise. But not really. People treat creativity as a natural idea, but it too was invented. And thanks to behavioral science, creativity became understood in the way that we know it now, a process of exercising personal capacity by mustering natural ability, perhaps against received expectations. And in that way, being creative or failing to be creative became a trait of the self, a property of you, and therefore something that you either had or lacked or had to overcome. But creativity actually started life on different terms entirely and relatively recently. The philosopher Alfred North Whitehead invented this neologism in two books that he published in the 1920s. Whitehead coined creativity for the philosophical discipline of metaphysics. That's the, the study of existence itself. Uh, for him, both philosophers and scientists had trouble, in his view, accounting for how new things arise. Now, that, that was true of conceptual ones like ideas for Whitehead, natural ones such as mountains or even material goods or invented things like dishwashers. But creativity was his attempt to, to come up with a concept and a term to name this process. And that still may sound relatively familiar to you. You know, creativity may still sound like inventiveness or imagination, something capable of producing original ideas or works, whether it's by humankind or by nature, 
or by God or by accident. But this received understanding of creativity actually gets things backwards, at least according to Whitehead. It's not that facts or things or people can be placed within or draw upon creativity. Rather, it's the other way around. Creativity is a phenomenon of the universe rather than a capacity of the human mind. In other words, creativity happens to you rather than because of you. As Whitehead himself put it, creativity is always found under conditions. And those conditions are much broader and deeper than human existence alone. So just as play names the conditions under which something can be explored or worked or manipulated, so creativity names the conditions under which novelty can take place. It's not a part of human experience for Whitehead, but a fundamental feature of existence. And thinking otherwise, which is really what all of us have done ever since, amounts to a kind of error. Uh, we might call it the creative fallacy. Uh, that fallacy mistakes our human exertion as the central factor. It's there, but as the central factor, it's not in acts of creativity. It's more of a peripheral one. Far more important are the materials themselves, the things we find ourselves surrounded by. And that too is a concept with precedent. Uh, the 19th century English designer William Morris once said, there is no art without resistance in the material. And he meant that art or creativity of any kind, as we might extend it, doesn't come wholly from within us. Instead, creativity is structured by materials and factors external to the thing created. In this case, the physical matter out of which art is crafted. And Morris went on to have enormous uh, influence on 19th and 20th century design, worked mostly in textiles, such as wallpapers and fabrics, but also in typography, in bookmaking, in stained glass, in furniture design, and other domains of craft. And this approach uh, would eventually take the name Arts and Crafts, and it became a thriving international design movement under that shingle by focusing on the simple traditional materials and methods for the creation of ordinary things, curtains and storefronts and everything else, arts and crafts proponents believed that the pleasure and meaning of craft production would imbue ordinary life with pleasure and meaning more broadly. Just as today's farm to table or local artisan movements are concerned with sustainability and responsible production, so too arts and crafts was a social and political movement as much as an artistic one. And if industrialization, which was of course active at the time, uh, depersonalizes the creator and the beneficiary of a craft object, then this arts and craft attitude might offer a reminder of the connection between made objects and the conditions required to make them. And so if you look at arts and crafts designs, they often were a simple in form, at least uh, uh, for their time, uh, naturalistic, floral, for example, hand-painted details were present and visible. And even though these materials are, are far more ornate than today's uh, more minimalist design tastes might prefer, they were still less artificial uh, than machined patterns of the era. And this extended into architecture and furniture design, uh, a process that emphasized the features of ordinary materials and construction methods, brick and stone and wood, making those things decorative by highlighting their physical properties. And all that is delightful and lovely. The problem is, how would anyone ever know any of it unless they already knew it? It starts to look a bit like the dot problem. To know the answer is to assume you already know the answer and that you're just rehearsing it. And this situation gets worse the further that we distance ourselves in time uh, from this moment. And you know, today you kind of look at these materials and it may just look uh, indistinctly old fashioned or kind of from a historical period, but without being connected to the specific properties of arts and crafts. There are more examples of this. The 20th century Russian composer, Igor Stravinsky had his own version of Morris's aphorism, which is the human activity. And this is from a 1959 book on the metaphysics of music must impose limits upon itself. The more art is controlled, limited, worked over, the more it is free. And that, that sounds great to me, uh, but you know, I mean, it's like easy for you to say, Igor Stravinsky. Proverbs such as these work well for accomplished creators because they kind of rationalize the process of success after the fact. You know, to be creative, just be like William Morris or just do what Igor Stravinsky did, whatever that is. 
In reality, it's a very long road from resistance in the materials or imposed limits to specific designs or specific compositions or whatever else. We need a different model. I found a better one in another pair of artists, Charles and Ray Eames, the 20th century husband and wife designer duo that brought us the distinctive Eames lounge chair, the powers of 10 film and countless other contributions to architecture and furniture and graphic design. In a 1972 interview, Charles Eames offers a way out of the risky anxiety of creativity. So after asserting in this interview that design depends largely on constraints, the interviewer puts the question to Eames, okay, well, what constraints? And Eames offers this reply, the sum of all constraints. And then he continues, here is one of the few effective keys to the design problem the ability of the designer to recognize as many of the constraints as possible, his willingness and enthusiasm for working within these constraints, constraints of price, of size, of strength, of balance, of surface, of time, and so forth. Each problem has its own particular list. On first blush, it might seem like Eames is offering no greater help than Morris or Stravinsky did, you know, like, okay, all the constraints, like I'll, I'll get right on that. Uh, but I think this advice is different and more helpful and even uh, truly liberating. Because if the sum of all constraints is ultimately of concern, then any single constraint contributes to that sum. It offers progress. Any choice is better than none because it allows you to make some progress in a given situation. Eames's revelation also helps explain why the dot game is so irritating. This test of creativity mostly amounts to asking the individual playing the game to guess what you are thinking, to divine which particular constraints you have secretly chosen as definitive. And if you just don't think to manipulate the space outside the grid, then you're deemed uncreative. But it's not because you're uncreative or inadept. It's because the apparent materials at play for one person might be different from those of another in a particular circumstance. When you think about it, the successful solver of the puzzle isn't really thinking outside of the box. They're just thinking inside a different one. Likewise, it's tempting to conclude that my daughter's improvised mall game arises because of this internal capacity for creative thought, or maybe just because she was a child and children aren't yet beaten down by the worldly expectations that keep adults inside our oppressive boxes. And, and there's some truth to those conclusions, but something simpler was also going on. She just saw the materials with which to play a different game than I did. I was focused on getting a task done efficiently, and she was totally unconcerned with that task and prim primarily focused on getting through yet another moment on earth around which she exerted limited control. You know, children aren't just less inhibited than adults. They're also less powerful. Uh, they are forced to live in a world that wasn't designed for them and one that is often not concerned first for their desires. And so children uh, like my daughter are constantly compromising. They're constantly adjusting to an environment that is not yet theirs. They are, in other words, always on the lookout for available constraints to embrace. And in my daughter's case, the restriction created by me pulling her fast through the mall in the situation she didn't choose and in which she had no interest, that invited her to reframe the materials at hand. I didn't even notice the tiles and they became the focus of her attention and an opportunity for meaning and delight. But the task of shopping was just wholly outside her concern. The thing that we shared in common was this literal connection between us, the, the fact that we had clasped hands and become one locomotive entity. You can imagine an alternative situation in which I'd taken her cues and embraced them. And in such a case, the constraints of, of us together would have become materials in a, in a new activity, a, a different game. Game designers have a concept that helps under, describe uh, and helps us understand this phenomenon. Uh, and it uses different geometry than the old familiar box. It starts with Johann Hoitzinger, a Dutch anthropologist of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And late in his life, as fascism was rising in Europe, Hoitzinger published this book, uh, Homo Ludens. And it situates play at the very center of human activity. Hoitzinger claims that a man is not primarily a knower, a homo sapiens, or a creator, a homo faber, but instead a player, a homo ludens. 
and Hoitzinger saw play as the means through which human culture itself is produced, rather than this kind of activity of distraction that we pursue when we grow weary of work. In the process, he looks at the rituals and practices of human culture, uh, including law, religion, war, politics. And Hoitzinger concludes that all of these practices rely on elements of play as fundamentals. In law, there's these roles of judge or of prosecutor. There are specific garments and accessories that are similar to those of, say, a theater actor, which is another domain we describe as play. The carriage of justice in a trial uh, bears much in common with, with theater, and it has the, the trappings of, of, of scripted entertainment. Uh, that maybe is par part of why we find courtroom television dramas so enjoyable. Justice is literally staged. For Hoitzinger, in order to function as venues for these ritual practices, all of these domains require some kind of separation from the world to demarcate their function and to contain their activities. I want to share with you uh, an important passage in, in Hoitzinger on this subject, which is kind of like an establishing shot for all of play and game design. All play moves and has its being within a playground marked off beforehand, either materially or ideally, deliberately or as a matter of course. The arena, the card table, the magic circle, the temple, the stage, the screen, the tennis court, the court of justice, all are in form and function playgrounds, forbidden spots, isolated, hedged round, hallowed, within which special rules obtain. All are temporary worlds within the ordinary world, dedicated to the performance of an act apart. In the middle of this passage, where Hoitzinger lists this sort of series of examples uh, of deliberately uh, marked off areas, you'll see that you know, most of them are pretty specific, naming particular locations where the stakes of culture play out. And, you know, so sports and gladiatorial combat in the arena and the tennis court or gambling at the card table or religion or ritual in the temple and carnival and, and mimicry on the stage or on the screen and uh, absolution or justice in the court. But one of these is not quite like the others. Uh, it's the magic circle. And, and it too has a specific meaning. It, it's the ritual space marked out by magicians and, and sorcerers. The, uh, and it has a relation with other sacred traditions in that respect too. The Hindu and Buddhist mandala, sometimes used as a symbol of a sacred space or a spot for meditation. But if we look at this as the most abstract and perhaps the least familiar of hoisting as examples of playgrounds, uh, the magic circle kind of stands out. And for that reason, people have looked at it more closely. It's taken on a special meaning in game design in particular, uh, uh, being adopted as a shorthand for the special space where uh, the place in space and time created by a game, you know, drawing a hopscotch court, treating a Scottish cliff uh, as a golf course, uh, following the rules uh, of a board game. And among those who make and study and play games, this idea of the magic circle has largely come to signify a boundary, the place that you have to cross over to enter the game. And it's often used as a tool for discussing the, the ethics of gameplay, what makes a, a, a someone a spoiled sport, for example. Like in Words with Friends, if you play that game, does it break the magic circle if a player looks up possible moves on an anagram solving website, or if you play World of Warcraft, and you go and buy a character uh, online instead of earning it through work, uh, doesn't that seem to violate the terms uh, of the magic circle? Uh, as I was looking into this more and more over the course of my scholarship on play, I noticed something. When game makers adopted the magic circle as a design concept, they, they added this sort of subtle reinterpretation of Hoitzinger's list. Instead of calling it the magic circle, that the, the place where richcraft takes place, uh, game designers uh, say, the, say it the opposite way, magic circle. Uh, they shift the emphasis from the magic um, to the circle, the abstract geometry in which anything whatsoever might take place. And in this way, through game design, this idea of a, of a magic circle becomes activated as a generic process of circumscription, an abstract act of inclusion and exclusion. And that gives us something that we can use in any domain. And Hoitzinger even anticipates this. He acknowledges that marking off a playground can be done not just materially, like with velvet ropes or stone blocks, but also ideally, that is, as a concept or as an idea or as a proposition. And this is a powerful notion because it means that we don't need to build arenas or temples every time we want to invent 
new ways of thinking and doing and living. It transforms this circumscription of play into something useful well beyond games as a way of delineating the context of particular states of the world as sites where creativity becomes possible. So we can replace the box along with all of its overtones of bureaucracy and power with the circle, a means of simply including some things while excluding others, uh, perhaps permanently or perhaps temporarily, perhaps in one context and not another, perhaps for some people, but not others. It helps us see the materials and conditions under which we are working so that we can discern what they are and what we might do with them. When my daughter reconfigured the shopping mall to service her ends, she did this by taking a portion of the context around her and drawing this conceptual line around it. On the inside of that line within the playground was an invisible imaginary membrane. And, and, and this held the tiles, her feet, the crowds, my momentum, and so on. Were I to have gotten over myself and joined in, constructing a little kind of cross-generational train of mall locomotion, then that first circle would have disbanded and a new one would have erected in its place. And this one would have subscribed, circumscribed both of us in a new and a different way. This approach kind of explains our previously consternating examples, the games that seemed to violate the magic circle. So if you take words with friends, for example, when you play a game like this on a mobile device, uh, then you have asynchrony. You're playing at one time and sending your move to someone else to play at another one. That's not outside the magic circle. It's a part of the experience. And as a consequence, the ability or even the temptation or maybe even the necessity in certain cases to look up words arises. And sure, you could see that as being a spoil sport, or you could reinterpret the game accordingly. It's no longer a game about making words. And now it's a game about kind of finding them by, by any means necessary, perhaps, including websites and dictionaries and other tools uh, you might fall upon. What's the best word you can make when you take as long as you'd like and use any resources that you can imagine? The same with the World of Warcraft scenario. Uh, we, we have to start seeing leisure activities um, as commercial goods, but also as sites of global flows of capital. And given the pliability of digital media across national uh, borders uh, and these secondary tools for making uh, digital materials unduly fungible and rising demands for digital goods, such as in-game characters, then it really shouldn't be surprising that arbitrage would arise. And then we just have to decide what to do about that, whether to embrace it, to regulate it, and so on. I want to get one last thing off my chest about this passage from Homo Ludens. All of the ritual spaces eventually get rolled up into one summative idea. And that's the playground, this notion of the playground. What does Hoitzinger mean? He doesn't mean this sand encircled space in the park down the street with the slides and the swing sets. That modern notion of the playground as a natural environment with physical equipment and space for kids, that didn't exist until the late 19th century. And it didn't really proliferate until the 20th. These were erected for moral reasons, for safety reasons. The playground was a, a place where rules and manners and sportsmanship could be exercised and policed. Uh, public streets where children had previously played became feared for breeding hooliganism, for physical danger because of the introduction of the motor car. Uh, and then we had the deplorable conditions of tenement housing, the rise of child labor laws, uh, and these invented a new standard of care uh, for children. And by some accounts, the very concept of childhood didn't exist uh, before this era uh, invented it. Uh, so, so what Hoitzinger means here uh, by playground is uh, uh, something that can be applied to any historical period. Anything whatsoever can be construed as a ground for play, a place where it becomes possible to take the materials at hand seriously and to manipulate them with deliberateness. So this is like serious stuff. This isn't mere child's play. It's where human culture, society, economics, ritual, and yes, leisure too, all arise. But despite that seriousness, much of the talk that we make of play involves this fantasy of recaptured childhood. If only we could return to this innocence of, of youth, then we could and just play within it, then we could be happy, we sometimes think. And there's certainly some subtext of that and even bringing up the story of my daughter. 
But even this historical playground, it didn't start as a space of freedom. It served as a new set of boundaries to contain the people and circumstances escaped from the old ones, you know, from the streets into the protected boundary of the park and from the tenement to behind the tall gates of the school grounds. No space is truly free. Limitation isn't bad on its own, although maybe some conditions of limitation might be. There's a reason we stopped supporting child labor after all. But things are complicated. The schools that replaced them, uh, complete with their playgrounds, were also invented to give kids a place to go while their parents worked. Nothing under the sun is a free-for-all nor an escape. Instead, each one structures different thinking and action. And this is exactly what we do when we develop something like a strategic plan, such as the one that Arts and Sciences is launching today. We ask what resources, abilities, and strengths we have at hand. We amplify those that make us distinctive. We introduce new ones that give us competitive edge or that respond to changing circumstances. And we choose the ones that we believe we can carry out uh, successfully. It may sound weird to say it, but strategy is also play. It's carried out by thinking inside the box of our resources, goals, and capacities while seeking ways to expand those materials into newly desirable contexts. The playground is us and our campus and our community and all the others with which it might connect. And that process never ends. The whole world is a playground made up of other playgrounds, but not because you can do anything you want with them. No, they're playgrounds because you can't, because the limitations of their particular component parts, including the people and social circumstances within them, create the spaces in which we can find meaning and impact. Playgrounds aren't things we create so much as structures that we discover, that we fall into, and then that we tolerate, and then that we endure, and then that we reform and tweak and adjust again. They're scattered everywhere, overlapping, exerting their will with or without us, but available for our address and our manipulation if we pay enough attention to see them and then to work within them. And playgrounds can become liberating, but only in relation to the constrictions that form them in the first place, not by escaping them, but by embracing them. That's creativity. It's not mere cleverness, nor the ability to guess what someone else is thinking, but the aftermath of an earnest struggle to grapple with the materials and contexts in which one finds oneself. Creativity doesn't happen when your cleverness shines through the murk, but when you feel the world vibrates as you engage with it, as you work it like a player or a musician or a woodworker or a dancer. Isn't that a relief? Play isn't about you, it turns out. It's about everything else and what you manage to do with it. Thank you very much for spending some of your day with me today. I think we do have some time for, uh, uh, for questions and uh, I believe we're gonna be siphoning those to me here in the, uh, in the chat. All right. Uh, so uh, a question here is, how does engineering interact uh, with my directorship in arts and sciences in film and, and, and media? So I think this is a fantastic question. It's something I think about uh, every single day. Uh, there's a couple of things I would say. Uh, the first is that the materials with which our disciplines are made uh, are materials that we can use and play. Uh, and when we have our students come in and, uh, and follow a course of study here at Washington University, uh, they tend to immediately gravitate to many different things. Uh, you know, I have uh, e economics and film uh, majors. I have computer science uh, and film majors. And uh, what they're after is a way of trying to get out, get into the world and, and, uh, and grab hold of it. And one of the things that we know is that computing and other forms of engineering are a very important part uh, of everything that we do, of every part of culture and society for good and for ill uh, today. And every medium that we use uh, is computerized. The one that we're using now is both media and computation. It's made up of computers and of film and images. So um, it's necessary. It's very important uh, that we have the capacity to look at all of the materials at play uh, within a university experience for research and for teaching and to ask what might we do with them if we look at them as partners uh, rather than as sort of different domains across the institution. One of the things I'm, I'm most looking forward to in this next era of arts and sciences is doing what, we, what makes us 
good at what we do in the, in the natural sciences, the behavioral sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. Uh, but adding to those uh, capacities, uh, incorporating uh, elements of business, of engineering, of the arts, of medicine, of the other domains that we have available and that we're so good at at WashU. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, a question about uh, studies that uh, demonstrate being paid to to play uh, and how those might uh, reduce uh, motivation. So, do we ref reframe our work as playing, or, or do you avoid this this drop in, in motivation? So there've been a number of studies over over many many years about intrinsic an extrinsic reward and, and motivation. And one of the things that we seem to know is that um, when you do something uh, for the sake of doing it, rather than because you're being rewarded uh, with money, with grades, um, uh, with other sorts of trappings, um, that those tend to be longer lasting and we tend to be more motivated uh, by them. Uh, the thing that I think is uh, relevant uh, to our conversation today when it comes to that example is that uh, what people really want to do is they want to feel their work, their effort, and their time meaningfully deployed in the actual work that they do. And yes, of course, you know, they want to be rewarded, they want to be paid, they want to be praised. But unless the work that they're doing in the moment, unless they understand it, know where it comes from, why they're doing it, whom it benefits, uh, then it's much less motivating. And so getting at that by not just by providing reward, by sort of saying, oh, if you, you know, take this major, follow this, uh, this line, then you'll be able to make more money, or you know, you'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, increase your capacity to, to reach a larger audience or what have you, to know this is what it's all about. This is what I'm doing. Um, it's important that we do that work of making work meaningful, making work meaningful, uh, not just by connecting it to uh, the impacts of that work, by making the day-to-day -day process understandable and tractable. Uh, how do I pair, compare creativity um, uh, to problem solving? This is, this is a really great question. Um, the puzzle, the game, the nine dot problem, which is sometimes called a puzzle, is sometimes so called because it appears to have a solution. And this is one way that we can distinguish uh, games from puzzles. Puzzles tend to, at least historically speaking, they have an answer. Uh, but of course, that's not the end of the story. And one of the things that a puzzle does, or that anything does, is that it escapes the context and purpose that people think to think about it. You know, when you go to, you're on like a road trip and you go to the, the Cracker Barrel or something and they have those little, uh, those little wood puzzles and, you know, your kids or whatever sit down with them and they're supposed to entertain them. They're pretty hard to do. Not everyone can, but, you, but even just picking them up and manipulating them, feeling the object in, their, in your hands or uh, telling a story about the time that you encountered it uh, as a child. Those are other things uh, that those materials uh, invite. So problem solving is a, a, one of the ways that, we, that our brains get pleasure, that we feel ourselves making progress uh, in the world. But it's not the only one. We don't always have to be immediately solving a problem and getting the feedback from it in order to feel that effort uh, that we've engaged in um, take hold, right? And just manipulating things that kind of exercises the muscle of solving problems uh, later, knowing what it's like to tractably work with something. That's why it's like nice to doodle or to strum on a guitar or to play on a piano, even if you don't know how to play the instrument. It gives you a sense of what this object means and how you might engage with it uh, further. Uh, is there a point where a, a game has too many restrictions uh, so the game uh, becomes uh, uh, paralyzed? Uh, so this is sort of like a Goldilocks point uh, in a design. Um, one of the rules of thumb, at least in teaching a game design and experimenting with it, is this idea that if we add uh, more restrictions, then, um, uh, then we can kind of feel the design process uh, emerging underneath us. Uh, but of course, if you, if you add more and more, eventually you do become uh, sort of straitjacketed. And this is also true of social conditions. You know, I don't want anyone to read uh, these comments as suggesting that we just embrace the circumstances we find ourselves in, even if it would be, be more beneficial socially, individually uh, to change them. Uh, but knowing that when we add restrictions, we're not necessarily moving away from pleasure, from freedom, from, from, uh, from meaningful living. That's the important thing, I think. Within game design, of course, a lot of factors come into play, uh, the audience, the genre, the, the, the aesthetic goal of the creator. And so there are lots of elements that those two become a part of the, part of the design process and a way of interpreting uh, 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 restrictions. Um, 
isn't this a call for more experiential learning and less reliance uh, on, on lectures? Uh, I think that that's a great point. And then one of the things that was a couple of questions here about, you know, how do we get more folks into film, uh, into the film? How can we do more, ex more experiential learning? I think this is, this is super important. And we are talking about these things, you know, part of the strategic planning process and the subsequent conversations that, that I and others have been involved in have to do with, well, what do we what do we do next? How do we do the work of an arts and sciences education uh, in what's going to become the middle of the 21st century? Uh, and I think our, our minds are open uh, uh, about this. And one of the things that we see the students uh, are wanting is to get their hands on more kinds of materials. But that's something that the, the faculty and the administration uh, want too. Uh, the world is changing and with it, the ways that we engage with it uh, also is following suit. Uh, okay, let's see, one, one more question here. Um, what would you posit as the necessary and sufficient conditions uh, for creativity? This is a big question. Uh, well, let me answer this question by, by looking at it two ways. One might say that in order to be creative, that first your needs have to be met as a kind of a Maslow's hierarchy kind of idea that you know, until you're sheltered uh, and fed and materially comfortable enough that you can think about creativity, uh, that you can't possibly advance such that you're kind of, you know, manipulating the world in that way. And I think there's a point to that, uh, but it also assumes that creativity is about leisure uh, or about productivity, whereas every aspect of our lives is a source of creativity. I think one of the reasons it's so useful and productive to think about uh, Whitehead's idea of creativity as something in the universe is that it makes us constantly look. And as long as we're open-minded, as long as we're looking all the time, kind of exercising this muscle of looking for something and then asking what it is, where did it come from? What might we yet do with it? Then we're being creative. All right, I think that's, uh, I think that's the, the clock in our questions. Thank you so much uh, uh, for your time today. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Ian, for such a thought-provoking presentation. And thank you to the audience for very stimulation, uh, stimulating discussion. Uh, I also want to thank all of you for joining us to celebrate the power of arts and sciences. It's truly because of the strength of our community, which includes all of you, that I am confident the next decade holds great promise for our school. Thank you again for your time and attention. I look forward to seeing you at the two events 